repeat uh, things uh, because we're doing a style change. <laughs> style change. Because we're different, but we're still one. So I'm going to be a little bit different, a little bit more calm, a little bit uh, a buzzkill, basically. <laughs> you know, I wanted to um, share what it's like to be an ethnic conference. We are the Pacific Coast Japanese Conference. We're the only ethnic conference in the FMC. And for the past, oh gosh, I don't know how many years, we haven't had an Asian leader in our Asian network, which seems weird, but the Lord brings all sorts of people to lead us with a heart just for who we are. And so I thought I would just share a little bit from my perspective and what's on my heart. Can I do that for a bit? It says two hours and five minutes, right? <laughs> Mark took all my time, so thanks, Mark. And uh, just as a little jab, we're one, Rob Roy, I don't know if you saw the picture of him, he's the only one with hair. So <laughs> afterwards, let's have him go outside and shave his hair, because Bishop Matt doesn't have hair, Mark doesn't, Michael Forney doesn't, I don't. You know, come on, Rob Roy, afterwards, let's shave that thing, become one, be committed. You're there. <laughs> When I, uh, 10 years ago, I went to Japan my very first time. Like I said, I look the part, but I don't speak the part. But I went to Japan because my daughter played basketball there. And it was an amazing trip. I, I walked around and I saw people just like me. I thought I was really weird and I probably am weird, but there was people weird like me in Japan. I mean, just the mannerism, they walked with their hands behind their back. When they would smile, they couldn't see their eyes, they would shut clothes. And you know, all those things that I thought, everybody looks at me and says, you're weird. And I thought it was weird, but when I went there, they were all the same. And I felt really comfortable there. I felt, you know, this is my motherland and I felt at home and it was just a, a really um, different posture that I took with who I am. Now, apart from the spirit, I, I felt whole. I, I felt whole there that uh, it was, again, different that I was in the majority because I'm so used to of looking out and not seeing as many faces uh, that looked like mine, but there I did. It was, it was a weird experience. And then a few years later, uh, GC19, actually, General Conference 19, uh, my wife and I were in Florida, and we were a little bit early to dinner. It was probably four or five o'clock, so the restaurants were pretty empty. And I go into the, to a restaurant, and there was a host, and she's kind of fumbling around with the menus, and uh, Lisa and I were standing there, and and uh, waiting for the host to, to seat us. And, and so we were sitting there and, and standing there patiently, patiently waiting, and she's fumbling. And um, all of a sudden, we're just standing there, and, and we're like, what is going on here? I might need to back up or go forward. And, and so we're like, there's nobody in the restaurant. Why isn't this host seen here? And sure enough, right after um, we were standing there, it felt like a few minutes, but it was probably just a couple of minutes or so, there was this other family that walked in behind us. And the host got up, took her four menus, and seated that family right away. And there we were standing there uh, in front of the host. And we're like, what in the world is going on? So we're standing, and we're standing. The host never came back, and finally somebody at the bar looked at us and said, do you want to be seated for dinner? And we're like, duh, you know, I mean, we're standing here. And as Lisa and I were eating our meal, um, I said to her, I think we were discriminated against because we were standing there. And I thought, I don't, I'm, I don't remember ever, that ever happening to me, but I think it was. And that was, you know, it, it was minor, but it's still, ticked me off <laughs> and made me angry and un this is not fair. Why do people think like that? You know, you just go into that deep, dark place. But as I started processing through that, 
I thought, here I was in Japan. I felt who I, I felt good about who I was. And then you have this restaurant host who discriminated against it. And there was a big gap in between me in Japan and me in Florida. Now, I'm not trying to discourage anybody for going for a general conference 23. That person's probably been fired and all of that. So, so please register for that. But there was a big gap of how I felt about who I am, my uniqueness in Christ, and just for my own, you know, my own health. I, I was like, what do I do with that? And so I, I was trying to look through the scriptures, and, and, but I couldn't find anything directly related to that gap. How do, how do we close that gap from being whole? Uh, we have the Spirit of God, and that helps. But there's, again, there's this level up here where you're never going to have that. So what do you do with that in the meantime, at least to bring it to a point where you can allow the Lord to put some healing into your spirit. But I stumbled upon this passage. We never stumbled, of course. The Lord directed me uh, to this passage. And it's found in 2 Samuel, verse, I mean, chapter 9, and it, I'll go through the whole chapter since, um, again, Mark set the criteria at two hours and five minutes. Uh, it'll take me just a little bit to get there because I also want to share a little bit about uh, the Pacific Coast Japanese Conference um, uh, as we celebrate the 90th, our, our 90th anniversary as a conference, which is amazing. So let's take, let's take this, and I'm going to walk you through real close. So for those who are really smart and, and look at every word to exegete and parse, uh, my apologies ahead of time, but I want you to grab these general principles with me. It says this, uh, chapter 9 in 2 Samuel. David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, let me set this up before I go a little bit further. David is king. Uh, he, Jonathan, uh, Saul and Jonathan are gone, but uh, Jonathan has a son named Mephibosheth. We'll get uh, into him uh, just a little bit later. But um, David is in the process of... of being king. Um, he's, just, uh, off, he's just outside of his victory. And so he comes to the house of Saul. And you know, the, the tradition or the conventional ways back then was to clear, kill the bloodline off of your enemy. And so he could have just killed Saul's bloodline off and thought, you know, nobody would have thought a thing about that because that was what they did back then. But David was different. And so David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? That's a big deal. He didn't go there. He broke against conventional practice to show kindness to Jonathan. Now, we know that he loved Jonathan as a brother. But still, that wasn't conventional thinking. And so when we're trying to close that gap, there's things that are not wrong, but they're different. And sometimes you have to go and break those conventional ways of looking at things and have different perspective on who your leaders are, who can do the things in the kingdom that may not look the same as you've always done it. That's what David is doing here. He's breaking conventional ways of doing things. Let's go on. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba, your servant? He replied. The king asked, Is there no one left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba, Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is in the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel. Verse 6, and this is a, uh, the, the second point. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to, to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. 
That is a huge statement. I love that statement. It, it warms my heart. So here is this bloodline that he could have killed off, but David chose not to. Instead, he brings Mephibosheth into his household to eat at his table. If you want to close that gap between this and this, you have to bring people into, onto your table. You have to give them a voice. You have to have them in a place of influence and not, dare I say, token or just the face of it. You have to bring them to the table. Verse 8, Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servants that you should notice a dead dog like me? Mephibosheth didn't have anything to offer David. All he had was himself, and he was lame in both legs. Uh, that's not on the verse, so I'll read it. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, the grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servants to do. David honored Mephibosheth just because of who he was, not what he could offer David, not what he could offer his kingdom. He couldn't do anything. He was lame. And yet David honored him to a place at the table. We need to honor those who look different, who are different, who have different style than us, but still have a lot to offer, that still have a lot to offer. We just don't see it. We just don't see it. It's a different perspective that we have to change in order to respect and honor different culture and dif differences in other people. Verse 11, and I'm closing up here quickly. When Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. This is awesome. Um, my daughter says, this is dope. But I thought that was a little bit awkward for a 60-year-old to say. <laughs> yeah? No? This is dope. Okay, anyways. Um, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table. Can you imagine him? He ate at David's table, but this is the kicker like one of the king's sons. Like one of the king's sons. He changed his profile. He changed his profile from laying that my evil you know, enemy, uh, his grandson, to one of the king's son. In order to close that gap, we need to come to the table. We need to recognize differences as being sons and daughters of the kings of the king. So that was to get my preach on. And now what I originally had on the slides, I want to get to just, I, I don't know, I'm not even looking at the clock anymore. Um, so I, I want to get to, to where we are as a conference. Um, 90, actually it was more than 90 years ago, uh, there was five churches where uh, white women started ministering to Japanese farmers and Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans uh, in the United States. And through that loose kind of relationships and missions um, work to the Japanese, there was five Japanese ministries or five churches that started uh, a little bit before 1932. Um, there was Anaheim, Santa Monica, LA, Phoenix, and Berkeley. And those five churches were, again, small ministries, just bumbling up, maybe a little bit past an organic uh, church plant, but uh, those were our starting five. But it actually started almost 20 years earlier than that, where uh, these women with a heart for those around them and for the Japanese came into our life as a, as a people and as a conference. Uh, in 1911, Mrs. Maud Thornton 
you can't see this, but this is just for re uh, reference, and I'll, and I'll read uh, the kind of the, the timeline, and I'll read it quickly. In 1911, Mrs. Maud Thornton began working with the Japanese farmers in Phoenix. That's my family and uh, our extended family, basically. Uh, Mrs. Thornton would later move to California to, be work, to begin work among the Japanese in Los Angeles. So it started in, in Phoenix, moved to Los Angeles, and in 1913, Beth, Bertha Allmeyer is commissioned by the General WMS to, to begin work among the Japanese in Santa Monica. So that's church number three. Uh, 1919, Maud Thornton began a Sunday school in Los Angeles as part of that commissioning. In 1920, the churches moved move to Los Angeles. In 1922, the church is organized and is organized, and Reverend Chioso Miabe is appointed as the first pastor. I should know how to pronounce that name, but I don't, sorry. Uh, um, Japanese names, are, I know, are hard. Um, in, 1960, <laughs> in 1916, Lillian Poole, a Nazarene missionary, uh, begins a Japanese Nazarene mission in Berkeley, the start of our Berkeley church. In 1920, the church becomes an FMC church in the California Conference. Thank you, California Conference. Uh, we're all one. Uh, 1921, home meetings in Anaheim were started by Chioso, Chiyosa Miyabe and Yoshimasa Shigekawa. 1923, the Anaheim FMC was officially organized. 1924, Lillian Poole was appointed supply in charge of uh, Mrs. Uh, in, in charge with Mrs. C. Miyabe as an associate worker. 1925, Lillian Poole begins to have Bible studies in Santa Monica, and that's where she marries Clyde Burnett. So we have all these white women ministering and building and planting churches in the Japanese, and the only reason why a man comes in is because a woman marries him and then tells him what to do. Uh, so uh, there you go. So we're a conference started by uh, women. Uh, praise the Lord. 19... <laughs> 1929, Reverend Clyde Burnett thought it would be beneficial to bring those five churches together as one conference. So the Anaheim, Berkeley, Phoenix, Santa Monica, and Los Angeles churches came together to form the PCJC FM as a mission conference. And if you show that slide of the, the camp. And in 1932... God ignited a spirit-fueled mo movement when a young adult confessed at a camp meeting. I don't know how many of you have been to camp in suits. I don't know, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, they dressed up in suits to go to camp. That was probably part of their confession. Uh, they went to the camp meeting, and uh, she started confess confessing her sin. And this is what she conf confessed. She confessed that she would have parties while her parents were out um, having Bible studies. They must have been studying Genesis or something because those would have been long Bible studies because they had parties. But anyways, the Holy Spirit fell upon this young woman and as a result, she confessed that sin. Another person started confessing that sin. The Holy Spirit fell upon that camp meeting and lives were changed. Lives were committed to Christ. People uh, committed their lives to full-time ministries, ministry. And... That was the birth of our conference. Uh, in 1932, with that revival still on the hearts and spirit of its leader, the PCJC was formally organized as a provisional conference of the FMC of North America. And Clyde Burnett was elected superintendent because his wife told him that he had to be superintendent. <laughs> From 1932 to 1942, the PCJC began to grow and expand. Now, why is this important? It's important because I want you to all know why there's a Pacific Coast Japanese Conference in the Free Methodist. In 1932 to 1942, the PCJC began to grow and expand. They started to get a, a little bit momentum. And then in 1942, when the war hit, all of the churches in the conference was clo were closed during the war, and its members were relocated to relocation centers. And so, if you go to that next slide. So, there's a picture of a camp. It's not necessarily the church, and you can't see it on the left. Uh, in 1942, uh, they all went to relocation camp, and... Uh, 
different um, from what I read. Uh, all they could really take is a Bible. And yet, those faithful Japanese Christians took their Bible and had um, prayer meetings and church services, and um, they had church in the camp. So the, the gospel did not stop in the camp. On the left um, is the appointments for 1944, and I wanted to read that to you. Uh, here's the appointment list for 1940. I won't name the, the, the pastors, but these are the location. Amachi Center, Colorado, Topaz, Utah, Poston, Arizona, and Gallup, New Mexico, Manzanar, California, Tule Lake, California, Phoenix, Arizona was a restricted zone, Rower, Arkansas, Gila River, Arizona, and New York. Those were all the places where the relocation camps were. That was the appointments for 1944. Can you believe that? Unbelievable. In, ninth, in December 17th, so the church had closed for, for three years. In December 17th, 1944, pu public proclamation number 21 w was issued. The rescinded, this rescinded the mass exclusion orders and formally allowed the Japanese families to return to the West Coast. I have an early reflection from Dorcas Early, who was another woman who ministered to those in Arizona. This was uh, her reflection of, uh, Ariz of, um, of an anniversary in Arizona. So there's a picture. This side, that picture, is the picture of a Tanita shed or Tanita barn. And uh, this is what it said. I count it an honor and privilege to write greetings for your brochure celebrating your 50th anniversary. This is 1982. Uh, my years with you during the evacuation were most memorable. Never shall I forget that Sunday at church when the news of Pearl Harbor broke into our service. The utter disbelief, shock, anger, and grief of our little flock. As the long procession was leaving for posting camp, we heard one junior boy call as he waved saying, We'll be back when Uncle Sam wins the war. Hope and victory were manifested even then in that statement. Then we began to make plans for the other half of our folks to hold services at Tanita's farms under the cotton trees. When the cold weather set in, we again needed a warm place. Again, Tanita said, we could use our tin roof barn, whitewash it inside and make a floor, altar, pulpit, even a box-like protection for the piano. Our church grew as did the fortitude of the people and steadfast faith in God. Trips to Poston Evacuation Center was just, um, and just trying to heal the hurt of, our dear, of my dear people as I lived under FBI surveillance in my little dollhouse on the deserted church compound kept me busy. No one has ever heard, ha, no one has ever had a more courageous group with which to work with. I will always tell my audience, and I'm still speaking in your behalf of the above incidents. Our hearts are welded together in deeper Christian love so my affectionate greetings to all of you who live in my heart on this joyous occasion. God's richest blessing be ever yours. I shall always be part of you. That's amazing, isn't it? That reflection. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you brought us out of it. And now we have today. Now today we are 19 churches. We have seven churches of what we call Nichigo, which is Japanese language church. So... You know, the, the war couldn't stop the Lord from building his church. Uh, captivity could not stop the churches from growing. And our conference continues to move and grow even today. Again, we have 19 churches, seven uh, Japanese language churches. But our churches are, are really diverse. Uh, even though we have Japanese in their name, um, we're, we're way... We've outgrown even our Japanese name. Uh, our, our churches are primarily Asian, and some are predominantly Japanese-American. Some of our churches look like the community that which they are in. A few are all different. A few, you can't recognize one food at the potluck. 
You know, you have tamales and sushi. So go figure what to do with that. And so we're very diverse. Our pastors are Korean and Japanese and black and white and Chinese and Latino. And they're all through our conference. We have the name. And just like me, I have the look, maybe not the language, but we're all different. We are, we are one. And whether it's been a war for three years or this stinking pandemic, uh, it's been, uh, it seems like it's been 100 years uh, with this pandemic. We have our Bible or we have our iPhones and we can do church. And we can grow and we can plant new churches and we can plant with diversity as the wind that the Holy Spirit is just blowing in our sail. Our vision is to equip, nurture, and, and grow a highly contextual network of healthy Asian leaders or those who love Asians uh, and multiply churches that will transform the spiritual landscape up and down the coast and beyond. So in, in simplest terms, we want to add value and resource our pastors to grow their churches, grow their ministry, grow themselves, and multiply themselves in order to to expand outside of and reach more of those who look like us and look like you, you're a beautiful bunch. And so we just want to grow and multiply. Some of our, some of our highlights. We, all of the four superintendents, I'm letting you behind the curtain a little bit. Uh, all of us four superintendents, we're just supposed to uh, highlight our conference. But uh, since Mark went long, and I know Rob Roy is going to bring his preach on, and probably Michael Forney, I thought, I'd, I'd do it too. Yeah, yeah. Anyways. So, so anyways, we, we have some great highlights. Uh, one of our churches, Splendid Light Church, started a ministry to homeless on, on Santa Monica Beach called, this guy's super creative, called Church at the Beach. Uh, this layperson is, uh, he, he loves surfing, but the pandemic closed him down. Uh, closed the beaches, and so he couldn't surf. And so what do I do? I, I, I love the beach. And so he's like, I'm just still going to go to the beach. And then uh, God broke his heart for the homeless at Santa Monica. And he's like, started reaching out to these, these homeless, and they're all over the place in Santa Monica. And, and, um, and so one by one, he started growing and brought his sister in, and then others started chipping in. And um, they had their two-year anniversary. So he started in the beginning of the pan pandemic, and they're still there. I, I was talking to, I forget who it was, but they said they, they're, there may be like 50 of them now, and I think they're going to baptize on Sunday, so you could be praying for that. Um, uh, amazing ministry. Uh, we have uh, launched an online hybrid church called uh, Reimagine Church. This guy, this pastor, is super creative. What he does is... Um, there it is. He has digital content, and then on Sunday they have brunch to talk about his messages. And they meet in oh, uh, such tough places, like at the Yacht Club or Marina Del Rey. They go to Marin County and sit in a hot tub. And they, but they do, but it's an online church plant, and he's just using what is available to him and his creativity and, and an iPhone and whatever else to bring the good news for those who are online and connects with so many different people that, would that you would never find in a church. We are preparing to launch uh, two churches. Uh, and our strategy is crowd decor. So we try to gr uh, plant larger ministries, uh, grow a core, and then launch bigger. And we know that the, the, the launch gathering goes a little bit smaller, but uh, we, we want to put in structures to, to have a strong, larger core to, from which to grow in. And we have two church planters, one uh, in West Portland and one uh, in Southern California uh, that we are uh, hoping to launch at the end of this uh, next, this, towards the end of the year. So I know Oregon ears probably perked up. You have one in, in West Portland? Uh, yeah, we do. How about that? And we're going to use you, and we want you to encourage our church planters, and we are networking all together, all around. Man, this is awesome. We get the church plant in Portland. I get to go see it and then know that they're being taken care of. How about that? 
we have uh, one of our pastors, our Nichigo pastor, he got COVID, couldn't come, but he's planting a Nichigo, a couple of Nichigo ministries in Lancaster, which is a, a gazillion miles uh, away from where he's at in his local church, and then close to his home. Japanese ministry is an unbelievable tough ministry. In Japan, it's less than 1%, or maybe Eric Spangler could t tell me a little bit, but uh, they, they, very few people are reached with the gospel in Japan. I think, uh, this is my theory, I don't have anything to back it up, but Japanese Americans, and then those that are ministering within our Nichigo Japanese language, they still have that DNA, that spirit within them that makes them hard towards the gospel. And so for them to reach out and to start different ministry and have a little bit of response to the Japanese, it's amazing, it's a miracle, and praise the Lord that uh, we have pastors that are, are reaching out beyond their comfort zone to uh, grow the kingdom. We are using COVID to reinvent ourselves, to innovate through it, to grow through it, to plant through it, to recruit leaders, to train them and send them out in order to grow the kingdom for more people to come to know Christ. And we're not exclusive of those who look like us or have an affinity to us. We want to reach everyone. But boy, do we love the church that's diverse. We love to go into the, these congregations and see everyone all different. And it is an amazing, again, miracle to see everybody come together as one. And amen. <laughs>